dangerous. Well, let me, let me, oh, can I walk here? <laughs> All right, let me see. Does this work? Um, maybe not so good, huh? Ah, maybe this is a little bit better. Um, let me first start by thanking Amos for going through the trouble of organizing these conferences. What we have seen today already is, is a very, very good indication of the status of uh, studies of information uh, at the very beginning of the 21st century. How many different types of information have we confronted with today? Uh, this reminds me more or less of the status of the, the, the concept of energy sometime in the beginning of the 19th century, where people were not even totally um, uh, uh, convinced that the warmth of living bodies had anything to do with kinetic energy. The term potential energy had been invented, but not yet the term kinetic energy, and they didn't know that these things were supposed to be conserved. We are today in a, in a I, I would say we are in a similar state of confusion about the definition of many of these terms. We do not agree. Now, that is, confusion is not necessarily bad. Uh, we're probably using the term information to solve different problems here. But it is good to be aware that we're using these terms with very, very different meanings for the purpose of solving very, very different problems. So thanks to Amos for putting us all together so that at least we become aware that this is actually going on. Uh, my subject is belief and desire. Pretty, pretty sexy for a physics talk. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see, does this move? Yes, let me start talking about belief. Uh, if there was anything that's supposed to be sex in the very beginning, it's going to disappear very, very quickly because I'm talking about beliefs of rational beings. I'm not concerned with the individual beliefs or the subjective beliefs of regular people. Uh, I'm concerned with the beliefs of ideal rational agents. What we're trying to do here is sort of develop um, a calculus for what it is we ought to believe, rather than a description of what it is that actual human beings believe. The, the analogy that I would like to propose is something along the lines of, suppose we are given two huge numbers and we are supposed to multiply them. We follow certain rules uh, that are supposed to guide us as to what we, are, we ought to believe the product of those two huge numbers is. Uh, a priori, I have absolutely no belief what the, the, the result should be of this multiplication. I'm totally confused. So I follow certain rules, I have a calculus, and by the end, I can do accounting and finance. My goal is not to develop a, a fuzzy arithmetic that would uh, accurately describe what high school school, uh, students actually would obtain when they do the calculation. That's not it. Very good. So the question that uh, I will try to address here concerning belief is what is information? And uh, as I said, there are many, many different uh, approaches to this. One approach is that information is epistemic. Uh, information is whatever is conveyed by an informative answer. Another that it is sort of like a probabilistic, whatever Shannon came up with. Another that is this algorithmic and that's what uh, normally studied under Kolmogorov complexity. And we've heard already quite a few about all of these. Uh, the epistemic type, which is the one I'm interested in, is, is the kind of information that we, use, we, we adopt in everyday usage. We ask an answer because, we ask a question because we want an answer. Um, Shannon information is, is of real value when doing communication theory, when doing physics, when doing econometrics. Algorithmic complexity is a concept that was essentially developed uh, from the field of computer science and uh, helps describe complexity. So these things are very different usages. One is concerned with meaning. It matters a whole lot what information that you receive means. Another one does not, is not concerned at all with meaning. It's only an amount of information, number of bits. Now, algorithmic complexity is more complex. It's concerned with amount and perhaps also with meaning. It's not, it's uh, well arguable. It's being developed. So what is the goal that I am here concerned with? The goal 
is to update from old beliefs to new beliefs when new information becomes available. This is the kind of calculus that I would like to develop, how you update from old beliefs to new beliefs when information becomes available. The old beliefs, and this is where I'm dealing with ideal rational agents, the beliefs are going to be described by a probability distribution. The old beliefs are described by Q, the prior. The new beliefs are described by T, uh, the posterior. And the question that I want to address, the first part of this talk is, what on earth is information? What is that? Now, the answer I'm looking for by, by design, this is the kind of answer I want, okay, is that we seek uh, an epistemic concept of information uh, defined directly <coughs> in terms of the effects that this information would have on the beliefs of rational agents. Oops. Ah, this is interesting, it moved. It's, uh, the, the, the ellipse is supposed to be on rational, so rational, this is crucial, okay? This is absolutely crucial. Now, uh, I know that in the audience there are lots of people who fool around with economics. The term rational here is used in a different sense than it is normally used in economics. Uh, this is not rational in the sense of people who, who are trying to um, play games or, or anything of the sort. Uh, I would say this is rational in the sense of people or, or agents who are trying to reason systematically. Very good. In trying to nail down this notion of information, let me draw an analogy from physics. Now, I, I know what some of you might be thinking out there. These guys are physics, physicists. Everything is going to be in terms of physics, right? If the only tool you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And the answer is, you got it, okay? <laughs> it, that's it, yes, that's it. And I have a reason for this. The reason I have, which is a very heretical one in physics, is that when we do physics, we're not describing ultimate nature and ultimate reality. When we do physics, what we're doing is we're processing information to make predictions about reality, to control reality, to explain reality. So physics is quite conceivably one of the better examples of how we can deal with information successfully. So that's why the analogy from physics is important. It's because an example where we know what we're doing. And so here goes. This is something that you probably learned physics 101. It's like the, 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 the most amazing instance of genius. It's Newton. If you have an initial state of motion, Described by its momentum, right? That's part of the genius, understanding what you mean, how you describe mathematically a state of motion. And then something happens, and you have a final state of motion. Well, what happened in this red blob there? Well, what happened there, you have no idea, but you give it a name. You call it a force. Force is what force does it changes states of motion. Force is whatever induces a change in motion. So you define forces as being the rate of change of momentum. You, the impulse is actually the change of momentum. So this is a very nice thing because you might not have known what force was. It's really interesting to look at accounts in the Middle Ages of what people thought force could be, right? And, and it's only when you actually come up with a a, a real pragmatic definition for the concept of force, namely force is what force does, it changes motion. Ah, if I know how to measure motion, I have an automatic definition of force, then you can use that. I'm going to do exactly the same thing with inference. And so if you have a description of your old beliefs and something happens and you get new beliefs, whatever happened there, I'm going to call that Information. Information is what information does. It changes your mind. Or at the very least, the mind of this idealized, ideal rational agent, okay? So information is what induces changes in rational beliefs. The word rational here is important too, right? If you're not being very rational, you can receive information and couldn't care less. It happens all the time. Ah, yes. This, this little blurb here, the red QM, is to remind me that 
It is not just that I'm going from physics to inference. For me, if this is going to be useful at all, I should be able to go back and say, if you have a theory of physics which is described in terms of probabilities, and you want to figure out how those probabilities change, you are going to do it in terms of information about what are the allowed changes. Quantum mechanics is a theory that's precisely of this type. So if you have a good idea of what information is and how it is processed, you can come up with the laws of quantum mechanics, which is pretty cool. So what is information? Information is what induces changes in rational beliefs. Uh, it is what uh, constrains beliefs. If you are rational, then not everything goes. You're not allowed to think whatever you want. There are constraints on what you're allowed to, to think, and you, can, and you want, if you still want to claim you're you're being rational. So information is constraints. Information is the constraints on probabilities. And, and the great advantage of doing this is that I started with a kind of wishy-washy notion of beliefs. You say this is because of like touchy feely and all of that. But that becomes very, very uh, structured once you say that beliefs are represented by probabilities. Same way here. Information is whatever changes beliefs. It seems wishy-washy, but the moment you say information is the constraints on probabilities, then this is something that's amenable to man mathematical manipulation and it becomes very uh, structured and rigid. <coughs> so, epistemic information does not measure amount of information. It's not Shannon, it's completely different. Epistemic information has no measure of amount. That's not the way we would characterize it. It's just the constraints, that's all. Now the question that uh, follows from all of this is, how do you select the posterior, the final probability distribution from among those that actually do satisfy the constraints? It's a matter of picking one. And uh, the idea is to rank them. The procedure, the strategy is, take all of these pro probabilities. I have a prior. I want to pick a posterior from a family that satisfies the constraints. How do I pick one? Which one do I pick? So the, the, the strategy is you rank these probability distributions according to preference. <coughs> And in a second, I'll tell you what is to be preferred, the criterion for preference. But the idea is that <coughs> you invent, uh, this is how we design the, the method. Uh, you invent a, a quantity, a real number associated to each probability distribution in such a way that you have a, a transitive ranking. If you prefer probability P1 to P2 and P2 to P3, then you prefer P1 to P3. So to each one, I'm gonna give a real number and I say, well, the one that has the highest number is the one that's to be preferred. So, this is part of the, the, the method, as how it's going to be, is being designed in order to fulfill a certain function. You associate to each probability distribution a real number that helps rank this probability distribution. That real number is called entropy. Entropies, therefore, are real functionals a real number associated to a whole function, uh, designed to be maximized. So it's not like the world comes with entropies floating out there. We invent these tools, and we invent them for a purpose, and we design them. This is very much like an engineering talk. We design them with certain design specifications to be make sure that the tool is working as, as we want. Very good. So the idea by design, the whole method becomes something like you select the posterior that maximizes this entropy, it's a relative entropy, the entropy of P relative to the prior Q, subject to the constraints. So what are those design specifications that I wanted to include in this ranking? How would I come up with this function S? First thing, I would like this function S to provide me with a general method for reasoning. Uh, I would like to have a method that is useful in the real world. When I do not know much about a problem, I want to have techniques that are of general applicability. So I'm going to design this method so that it applies everywhere. To be useful, the method must be of general applicability. So what we want to capture in this function S is what are all of these methods of inference might have in common. The differences 
are going to be assigned to different problems, different constraints, different contingencies of each inference problem. We look at the commonality here. Uh, this, this statement, it comes in small print, and there is a reason for that. What I'm telling you here is that there is no distinction between probabilities as they're supposed to be used in clinical trials and probabilities as they're supposed to be used in, say, uh, economics. And in particular, there are no pro difference between the probabilities that you're supposed to use in classical physics and in quantum physics. So, so this is where things start pushing in directions that are not normally accepted out there in the, in the big world. From this approach, there are no quantum probabilities. It's probability theory, end of story. This is a universality uh, design feature. And uh, what uh, makes it, what allows me to fix what the function, this fun entropy function is going to look like, is, is a principle of minimal updating, which is motivated by the fact that uh, whatever information I've managed to process yesterday and the week before, whatever I learned in the past is useful. And I don't want to throw away all that valuable effort that has been put into creating the prior. I want to keep as much of the prior as possible, right? What my grandmother told me yesterday is valuable. I don't want to throw it away very easily. Therefore, I will only try to update, oops, not yet. I will only try to update what I need to in order to be in agreement with the new information, the new constraints, but keep as much of uh, as possible of, of what was uh, learned earlier. Uh, one of the advantages of this approach is that what I'm going to constantly specify in trying to come up with this entropy form is not how I'm supposed to update. And the reason is that if I have something and I have to change, I have to be extremely specific about the possible ways to change it, right? And that may be that leaves room for lots of subjectivity. What I'm going to do is exactly the opposite. I'm going to tell you what not to change in the prior. When I update certain features, I don't want to change. The reason that is interesting and extremely useful is that while there are many, many ways to change something, there is only one way to stay the same. So, so what I'm actually going for here is an updating process that is maximally objective, that has an incredible amount of inertia. I will only change my mind provided I have real reasons to do so. Very good. The specific design specifications are, are going to be three, and I'm going to go very quickly over here. What you're supposed to capture from this is essentially that there are three. That's it, okay? Because this comes in the form of slogans. Locality. The first design specification is that local information is an updating process that is maximally objective, that has an incredible amount of inertia. I will only change my mind provided I have real reasons to do so. Very good. The specific design specifications are, are going to be three, and I'm going to go very quickly over here. What you're supposed to capture from this is essentially that there are three. That's it, okay? Because this comes in the form of slogans. Locality. The first design specification is that local information has local effects. And what that means is the following. If I'm doing inferences about a variable x, use x, and I give you information about these x's, then the probability of those x's conditional on being in that region are not going to change. All right? I'm not going to change conditional probabilities in a region that I didn't tell you anything about. I'm going to keep it the same. And what that means, well, if information does not refer to a particular domain D, then the prior QX conditional on D, and the conditional is important, is not updated. So here is my rule. I'm not going to change it. There's only one way not to change it, okay? That's it. This is an amazing rule because it is this rule that makes sure that the entropic methods of inference are completely consistent with Bayesian methods of inference. The method of entropic inference here is being designed in such a way as to incorporate uh, Bayesian data analysis 
in those particular cases where the information comes in the form of data. The syntropic method is a little bit more general because it allows for possibilities of uh, updating when the information does not come in the form of data. It comes up in the form of, uh, my grandmother told me something or, or, or the expected value of something. Um, so, but Bayes rule is included as a special case. The second important design specification is much easier to understand, which is that the coordinates that you use in a certain problem do not matter. It amounts to saying more or less that if you're going to carry out uh, an inference in English and you carry it in French, you better agree or else there is a problem, okay? It doesn't matter what kind of language you use. You can use Cartesian coordinates, you can use circular spherical coordinates, uh, confocal paraboloidal coordinates, whatever you want. It shouldn't make any, it may be more difficult to do the calculation in one coordinate system or another, but it shouldn't make any difference uh, as to the results. Finally, there is a third design uh, feature included in the, in, the, in, the, in the whole scheme, which is like really important, which is considerations of independence. The reason this is important, and, and, and the, the slogan that goes with this is that not everything matters. And you'll see how this comes about. Is that if you're trying to do science of any kind, if your, your methods of science are going to be useful at all, it must be possible to talk about a particular system of interest without having to include the rest of the universe. If, he, if in order to talk about something, you have to talk about everything, your science doesn't go anywhere. So as a feature here that I want to have my method to include, that I want it to satisfy, is that it must be possible to recognize that there are other parts of the universe that are completely independent of my system. Something out there doesn't matter. And the, 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 the formal mathematical way of actually stating it doesn't matter is that when two systems are believed to be independent and we get information about one, it should not matter whether the other is included in the analysis or not. I must be able to talk about this system here and Andromeda or just this system here. It shouldn't make any difference whether I include Andromeda in the picture or not. Uh, very good. With those three constraints, we're done. The ranking of universal applicability that implements this desired desire feature of minimal updating, maximize, uh, give value to prior previous information, is given by relative entropy, and that's the criterion. There is a criterion. That's, that's a, the, the crucial thing. So let me summarize this first part of the talk. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fine print. Other entropies may be useful for other purposes, right? Not for updating. There are such things as Salis entropies, there are Rennie entropies, and those are amazingly useful constructions that are very, very useful for other purposes, not for updating. They violate the, uh, the, this design feature of uh, independence. So if you're going to maximize an entropy, a Salis entropy, because you are interested in making inferences about this system, and you decide to include Andromeda in the picture, well, guess what? It changes your conclusions. So you have to be very careful about what you do then. Anyway, so here's the summary. This is a space of all probability distributions. So this is a large space. One point in this space, so that's, it has infinite dimensions, right? right? One point in this space is the prior. That's the prior. If you were just talking about Gaussians, uh, the, then the prior would actually be, be defined, univariate Gaussians, one-dimensional Gaussians, the prior would be defined by, say, the mean and the variance, right? So that point would be a point in a two-dimensional uh, plot. Very good. Now we get our constraint. Our constraint is, my grandmother tells me that I shouldn't believe Q anymore. That's not the right probability distribution. I should believe something in the blue region. So the question becomes, which of these points in the blue region do I pick? The procedure is, rank them according to entropy. 
the maximum is going to be uh, here at the prior, right? Which tells me if I had to pick the one with maximum entropy and absolutely no information, I would not change my mind, which is like a reasonable feature of rationality. If you were very careful about picking your prior and you get no information, why should you change your mind? You already thought about it. Um, anyway, but you do have a constraint. And so what you do is you proceed to pick the probability distribution in the blue region that has maximum entropy, which is that one. And that's it. This is what the method is all about. We can do statistical mechanics, we can do thermodynamics, we can do uh, quantum mechanics with these things, we can do an incredible amount of damage in science. We, with Amos, we're actually trying to do some economic modeling too, uh, and hopefully that, and it looks good. It's gonna work, yeah. Um, uh, there is another question that you can ask here, which is like really interesting, uh, which is the following. Are you, are you really convinced that that little point there is, is, is the answer and that all neighboring distributions here that have very close entropy are to be supposed to be like thrown away? Wouldn't you have fluctuations, a little bit uncertainty there? Yep. And uh, the answer is that you can ask for what is the probability that you should believe something that lies not there, but in, in that little volume element. And the answer is the probability that the choice should have been there is actually according to the exponential of the entropy. So if you have an exponential decay here, that is much, much lower, but there is a possibility of fluctuations here. I love this formula. That was the Einstein formula for thermodynamic fluctuations that he came up with 1905 when he first worked out the theory of Brownian motion uh, and proved that atoms exist. So, so it's very interesting how we end up uh, beginning of the 21st century, we're inventing these theories, inference, trying to do physics, and then we start discovering all the laws that were invented in the past from completely different intuitions. So that's why physics is inference too, even when people didn't know about it. Very good. Uh, what next? Oh, yes, yes. As I said before, this sort of formalism includes Bayes, uh, includes the regular max -Cent method of uh, Jaynes and Shannon, and includes large deviations theories of special case. Very good. Desire now. The question is processing information and updating require an incredible amount of work and labor. Thinking is difficult. We'd rather not think. So why bother? Why collect information and why go through the process of processing information? Why not just stay in bed all day? Answer, better beliefs lead to better rational decisions. So the real reason why we update is that we have a prior but we know, this is, this, is that, uh, yeah, this is what I ought to believe on the basis of past information, but let's face it, I mean, it's incomplete information. What happens if I get better? More constraints, more information. Can I have more trustworthy beliefs? Yes, and better beliefs lead to better rational decisions. So let me tell you a little bit about decision theory. And from now on, I'm going to be saying things that are completely standard. Nothing new here, okay, except for one thing. What I want to show here is the following. If I said that the notion of information that I am, the notion of entropy that I am pushing here has no interpretation, that it doesn't measure amount of anything, then how can I actually go ahead and try to quantify amount of, a value of information, an amount? Where does the amount come from? It's not entropy. That's not it. So how do I assign a value to information? What I would like to say is that the tools for assigning value to information are already implicit in anyone who's doing decision theory. And the idea is that some states of the world are more desirable than others. We want to have them be, come about. We want to work towards making them come about. <clears throat> so to each x, and X is a state of the world, we associate a measure of desirability, we associate a U of X, and uh, 
this desirability or value is described by a utility function. Now, now you see that there is nothing new here. What I'm doing is extremely simple, but it also comes with all the difficulties that are inherent in decision theory, namely, how do you come up with a utility function? Different people are going to have different utility functions. It's not even obvious what my own utility function is, what my values are. It's not obvious, those are problems to be solved. Those problems are carried over completely from decision theory into any theory that tries to assign values. The same information is going to have different values for different people. That's, that's what's going on already here. Uh, so, <clears throat> the idea is that different actions, we must decide on an action, and different actions lead to different states of the world. So the rational decision is choose the action that maximizes utility. Um, rational, human, rational agents might behave this way, human beings do not normally do this. But there is a complication. The complication is that the consequences of our actions are uncertain. When we perform an action, we do not really know what it's going to lead to, what uh, state of the world will result. And this uncertainty is described by a probability. It's the probability of X, the state of the world, given that uncertain action alpha was performed. So then what we have is we do not really know what this, the utility is. What we may be able to compute is the expected utility. We take the utility function ux, we average over it with the, the function here, the probability that describes our uncertainty which, about which is the actual x, and this gives us an expected value for the utility, for the action alpha, uh, sorry, expected value for the utility when the action taken was alpha, and the, the state of prior probability was given by q. The rational decision, is choose the action that maximizes expected utility. And so the alpha that is most rational to choose in this situation is maximize over alpha, that UQ. That's standard, standard decision theory. Um, I'm going for the very, very simplest form of decision theory. You can really complicate this issue by saying, what if your utility depends on this? What if it depends on that? Uh, you can really complicate it, but what I want to point out is that I'm carrying whatever decision theory you, you prefer into this formalism where entropy uh, is a tool for ranking probability distributions and doing updating. You can just transform that uh, automatically. Very good, so the complication is that we do not know what, action, what consequences result from our actions and uh, rational decision is maximize expected utility. But now we can answer the question, why should we update? Why bother? And the answer is, if we receive information, we can update. And if you update, you have a new expected utility. The rational decision is to make the better decision, right, of maximizing this updated expected utility. Very good, so now we can talk about the value of information. The only thing here that has value is, or, or represents value, is utility. That's, that's all there is to it. So value is measured by utility. Different rational agents who have different utilities will assign different values, yes. Um, so here we plot expected utility as a function of alpha, of the action. If our degrees of belief were measured by that prior probability distribution, we have this green curve, right? It's the expected, the, the utility, expected value under Q, the prior. And you can see what the optimal decision is. It is the one that maximizes the green curve. But now you acquire information. When you acquire information, the expected values will change, of course. And now you see two important things here in this new curve. First, the optimal decision lies somewhere else. The, the optimal decision is not alpha Q, it's alpha P. Second, your, ori uh, and so there. Now, the, the actual utility, expected utility, can go up or down or whatever, I mean, and that, that's not the point I'm trying to make here. It's just that the best, the best action under the new state of information is different. 
The second important piece of information is that your original estimate of utility was wrong. It's not at the top of the, let me see, where's my arrow here? It's not there at the top, you were wrong. It's a much, the, the, the blue curve is a much better assessment of utility than the green curve. The real value for utility when you take the action of a Q is the one at the bottom. And there is a change in that utility. So the value of having acquired the information that leads you from prior Q to posterior P is the difference of those two utilities, expected utilities. So there, that's the value of information. And it comes with all the subjectivity and uncertainties and everything that characterizes uh, uh, utility functions. Good, I'm done. Conclusions. Duh. For those of you who have attended previous conferences of this type, you must appreciate what an unusual event this is. I am finishing within my allotted time. Uh -huh. This is, this is, this is. <laughs> anyway, the two conclusions on belief. Information is what information does. It affects your beliefs. On desire, information has value. It leads to better decision, decisions that allow you to achieve what you want. Uh, to put a little bit more flesh into this, to make it sound a little bit less wishy-washy. Uh, conclusions, epistemic information is the constraints. This is something that can be mathematically implemented. The criterion for updating is you keep as much as of, of what you knew before, before uh, updating it. You only update what's really necessary. Previous information is really valuable. The tool for updating is entropy. You do not need to interpret it in any way in terms of heat or in terms of disorder and not in terms of amount of information either. In this approach, none of those things are, are uh, necessary, which is wonderful because if I keep my mouth shut, I can't make a mistake, okay? So I won't tell you what info entropy is. It's just a tool for updating. Um, Maxent based large deviations, I didn't really prove any of this, but it's nevertheless true, are special cases of this. Which, by the way, is really, really important. Uh, many of you might know that one of the real, real problems in quantum mechanics is that there are two modes of evolution for the wave function. One is unitary time evolution when you have the Schrodinger equation, right? And the other is when you perform a measurement that is a wave function collapse, right? And this is one of the things that was bad, bad, bad physics from the very, very beginning. People are nuts over this, right? Anyway, if you figure out that information is being processed differently, but it's nevertheless processing information according to entropic, means when the particles are evolving continuously, and this is different from when you actually put a big measurement device there and you hammer the particle into submission and you collapse the wave function, right? Two very different situations it appears, but it's just processing information. One is given by entropy methods and the other is the special case of Bayes. So, so there, the solution to the quantum measurement problem is the recognition that Bayes' theorem applies to quantum mechanics. Pretty nice. So this is important. Uh, finally, the value of information is the change it induces in expected utility. Thank you. So uh, I have two questions, maybe I'll just ask one. Uh, one of them is, so in this final definition, the idea that the value of information is the change in utility, I can imagine mathematical and or physical systems where when I provide new information, those, the, the utility distribution jumps around like crazy, right? And so that uh, it, I have a system that's jittery in some sense and that a very small change in this information is providing me these changes in, apparent changes in utility based on my updated posterior, but that's not necessarily meaningful because I just have a kind of system that's very jittery and the next time I get a new piece of information, it'll recenter my... I, I'm not sure that you're thinking of utility the way that, uh, that people who have to make decisions are okay. thinking about utility. Uh, 
Typically, a person who has to make decisions will have a, a, an option, a menu of choices, and each one of these has its own expected utility. Nothing needs to be shaken, or maybe it is, but, but the idea is there is a utility associated to one of each one of those actions. And uh, the weight will change, shift around when I update. So, so it, it may, the situation you described, awfully as it looks, may not be quite what people are interested in when they want to make decisions. Okay. Yeah. Hi, Eric. Uh, it's a great talk. And, uh, and sort of, uh, what's your view about the, 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 in terms of the truth? Because when it comes to the two uh, probability function, P and the Q, yeah. which are often we don't know, we couldn't find out what is the true probability function, P and the Q, at a specific time. So that's the truth. I, I'm sorry, I guess I've had a problem. <laughs> so so, so back, go back. Choose, going back to your old relative, uh, the earlier oh, oh, slides no, 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 on the oh, okay, relative okay, entropy okay. And, uh, and the, with the P function and the no, Q I function. The true probability. Probabilities, just like an entropy, well, probabilities are tools for reasoning. They serve to describe the degree to which I ought to believe in the truth of a, of a certain proposition. They, another way to describe it is uh, a probability describes the degree of implication in which A implies B or so, things like that. So, so they're not, probabilities are not true. They're not, they do not reflect states of the world. They are tools for reasoning with incomplete information. They're tools. They're not. And so, so if, if the, my prior reasoning led me to believe uh, in, in, a, in a certain Q, and then I, I acquire new information and say, okay, now I change my mind, I go to, to some, other, uh, some other probability, I update. But none of those are states of the world. We're not talking... <laughs> That's why I say, physics is not about reality. Physics is more about what we can say about reality. Physics is way more like economics than people will tend... <laughs> I mean, economists, economists, <laughs> economists are, 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 are honest enough to recognize the limitations of their modeling. <laughs> Physicists have not yet reached that level of wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, I got my points here. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, yeah, uh, a, a quick one. Yeah, a quick one about uh, slice 19, but I can do it also without the slides. The slides. Um, um, so you walk into a party and you want to know who Mary is, okay? And uh, someone. No, no, no. Uh, let me finish. Let me finish. Okay, you, you want to know what X is, and someone tells you X is what X does. Now that is fine, but it's a criterion to identify X does not tell you what X is. Are you happy with that? I'm, I just, uh, it's an open question, it's not a criticism. So you may be told Mary is the one who is actually cutting a cake. You don't know who Mary is, but you can identify Mary, and you go there and shake the hands, oh, hello, Mary, fine. So is that the difference between criterion for X successful versus definition of X. I think you're, you're objecting to the information is what information does, right? I'm not objecting. I'm just asking oh, you whether you're happy with uh, the criterion I, base I, rather versus the I'm definition. Actually, I'm actually retreating from saying what information is. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, uh, you don't need to know more than if I have a constraint, this is the way you update. Forget the word information here now. Forget the word information. I have a prior. My grandmother tells me, ah, forget that prior, you better believe one of these probability distributions here. I update. I never use the word information, right? So information is a little word that we append at the very end to make this process uh, a little bit more palatable and more efficient, right? But uh, I never needed to tell you. Much the same way that when you do statistical mechanics or thermodynamics, I may be interested in, in, in figuring out if two systems are going to be in thermal equilibrium, whether heat is going to flow or not, right? And I may do my calculations, and then there is a particular parameter there that appears in my calculations that I call T. And the question is, what does T do? Well, I don't know, but if T is big and, the, and this T is low, then heat flows that way. Uh, and if it's the other way, it's the other way around. And so at some point, I'm going to say, oh, this T appears all the time. I'm going to give it a name, temperature. So uh, I'm, and that's the way I'm going with information. I'll, I'll give it a name to a particular concept that keeps appearing all the time, namely constraint.
sense that you, you place, you, you describe your preferences in the form of, if I prefer x1 to x2, I assign a bigger u, x1, then it's the same thing, it's taken into care, in care uh, automa automatically. It's automatic. It's 